So good afternoon. Let's get started. My name is Gaiman Yi. I'm the technical director of the I4 Energy Center. Is this microphone on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Uh, welcome to today's I4 Energy Seminar. I want to also welcome those who are viewing this seminar uh, on the internet. Um, today's speaker is uh, Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf Oster. Uh, Dr. Oster is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the San Diego State University. His current research interests include the MAC protocols, residential networks, wireless sensor networks, pervasive computing, residential energy management, and wireless healthcare. Uh, he owes five U.S. patents and has published over 80 scholarly papers and book chapters. At San Diego State University, Dr. Osterg is also the director of Pervasive Computing and Network Embedded Systems Laboratories. He is a core member of the NSF Sensor Sensory Motor Sensory Motor, sensory motor uh, Neuroengineering Research Center. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Oster. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Gaiman. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about enabling technologies for residential demand response. This is uh, partially the outcome of our research that was supported by CIEE and uh, my uh, collaborators on this project, my colleagues, uh, uh, Sunil Kumar is sitting here, and Gordon Lee were my partners you know, during the development of this, of this project. So my mouse doesn't even work. Now, needless to say, this work would not be possible without the contribution of several people, several students and uh, other partners contributed to the ideas that will be presented here. And uh, uh, without the support of California Institute for Energy and Environment, we wouldn't be able to hear. So, uh, the problem is, is common. The, today's grid is aging, it's outdated, it's unreliable. Uh, it costs billions of dollars to consumers. And uh, during the last uh, three hours of uh, outage in San Diego, we have shown that we are not also very resilient. In the first hour, San Diego State University uh, decided to cancel all the classes. Uh, half of the city actually was shut down. All classes were canceled because the electricity went down you know, for two, I think it was a total of three and a half hours. And the loss that we incurred from this was huge. Um, the, so we're very vulnerable to uh, energy losses. The current infrastructure does not address the 20, 21st century power needs. And there is a bunch of things that uh, affects the, uh, the trends, uh, that affects the uh, pr problem and increases the effect of it. So the cost is one, reliability, peak loads, I think that's the most important one and that's what we are going to try to address. A set under utilization and grid divorce are among the, one, the, among the uh, trends that will affect our energy uh, need. Now, we can modernize the network, but the, the cost of modernization of in the order of 17 to 24 billion per year and the benefit uh, from the modernization is 2.8 to 6 uh, overall. And this is actually a little bit worse than the estimates by APRI in 2004. They estimated 4 to 1 or 5 to 1. By then, now it's a little bit worse. And the problem is getting even worse because we have a hype in electric vehicle penetration now. There's uh, a considerable number of, you know, considerable programs and a considerable number of electric vehicles are uh, emerging in the market. So the Morgan Stanley research uh, estimates by 2015 1.2 million units and by 2020 2 million units will be out there. And uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, when you look at the estimation for 2050, we're looking at basically an increase of uh, the plug-in hybrid vehicles to be, to grow by 80% while on the high side, while the conventional or, you know, the total of conventional and hybrid vehicles to grow by 20%. So that shows how much impact is going to incur in, in uh, the uh, power loads. So the question is, with all these increases, with the existing power loads that we're not able to cope at the point when the energy demand is at peak or at mid-peak, 
and with the incoming uh, power loads by the electric vehicle penetration, how are we going to address the growing demand, growing energy needs? How do we reduce the more, pro the more precisely, the question is, how do we reduce the peak energy demand so that we can flat out the demand and rather than design the network, design the infrastructure for the peak demand, we design it for the average demand and we delay that uh, investment in new technologies, rather utilize what we have today at its best. The answer is smart grid and uh, there's a whole bunch of characteristics that are defining small grid and I think our study or the talk that I'm going to do today is uh, highlighting three of the uh, several characteristics that are of importance. One is active consumer participation. If we can get consumers to participate in energy planning or energy management, then we can flat out the demand. Accommodate all generation and storage options. And finally, optimize asset utilization and operate the system more efficiently. Now, we have been trying to do this by running demand response programs, uh, which is available to large-scale consumers when the consumer can commit a minimum of 50 kilowatt and it can basically, it can uh, accept a day ahead bid and uh, curtail its uh, uh, power usage within 15 minutes in some cases to, uh, you know, d d down, down, down to 50 kilowatt, then uh, the demand response systems are available uh, to flatten the, uh, the demand or reduce the peak demand. So the enablers for this, that uh, the power utility company is using time of use pricing, peak time pricing, and demand bidding technologies. Now, this is available, as I said, it's available already by, I think, uh, by pretty much every utility company offers some sort of incentive to uh, high power consumers to curtail their demand or their usage. Anaheim Public Utilities offers a, pri a voluntary load reduction program where businesses are notified by pager uh, to uh, prepare their loads for you know, curtailment. And they, they give you a 15 minute basically time uh, to curtail the, that, uh, your uh, power usage. Burbank offers similar programs. Burbank in addition offers residential power uh, time of use pricing and the same time of use pricing exists in San Diego and several other cities uh, which basically divides the time zones into the, the time into uh, peak, uh, mid peak and off peak periods both in the summer and in the winter uh, periods and uh, different pricing is applied at these times. So if you look at this diagram you can see that uh, during off peak, summer off peak which is after 6 p.m. Uh, or between 6 and uh, after 6 p.m., you can actually get 0.08 cents per kilowatt, uh, while uh, the same number at peak duration will be 21 cents. So that's about three times more. Now, time of use pricing is there, but only at a very coarse granularity. We're not still there that we do not have, or none of the utility companies, as far as I know, has a combination of tiered pricing and time of use pricing. They have it separately for businesses. So if you use up to a certain kilowatt, the power is uh, priced differently than above a certain kilowatt, which is available, let's say, in San Diego. But tiered pricing and time of use pricing are not really bundled together. So that's one of the things that we're going to try to address today. And the second thing is time of use pricing is available, but demand bidding is not available to uh, residential consumers because they are small. They're not large scale consumers. But what we think is we think if we can bundle, aggregate uh, the residential users in a neighborhood and if some authority, which we call a power reseller, can present the aggregated demand to the uh, energy company, then residential users could be part of the demand bidding system and could benefit from this as well as they could contribute to the uh, flattening or smoothing of the demand uh, and uh, trash, you know, uh, reducing the peak demand. So the idea is to create a power reseller 
in the middle for res residential consumers or aggregator for residential consumers, which will query the demand from residential consumers and uh, will uh, bid uh, for energy with the utility company. And depending on the pricing offered or the incentives offered by the utility company, it comes up with some intelligent way of pricing the energy so that the consumers will choose wisely and will uh, contribute to the reduction of the peak power. There comes a problem. The consumers actually do not know much about this. An average consumer in the United States will not go on to, um, well, average consumer like myself, I wouldn't actually look at my energy bill, okay? I would receive it at $75, I would just pay it off. I wouldn't look at how much energy did I spend at what tier. Most people will not look into that detail or they will not keep those details to run it. So we need something in the home to manage that so that the consumer will not, will not be burdened by the complexity of the pricing and by the complexity of the demand. This is our idea. So what we think is if we can design a master controller, a home energy manager, which will predict the demand in this home and uh, uh, communicate the demand in this home to a power reseller or the utility company to be aggregated into a bundle energy demand. And based on the pricing, if the master controller if the master controller, home energy manager, can manage the load so that it can shift the appliances runtime around uh, the uh, pricing schedules to optimize, to reduce the cost for the consumer, but as well to flatten the, uh, the peak demand, uh, this system could work, which will basically take the consumer off the uh, chart. It will learn the master controller will learn from the consumer's behaviors and will based on the consumer's past behaviors and future interest or requests it will uh, generate the predicted demand for the power company and uh, based on the pricing it will manage the appliances now the master controller then will interact with the appliances it should be able to communicate to appliance managers, which turns on appliances, turns off appliances, or chooses the mode the appliances run. It should be communicating with the user to receive uh, future schedules, uh, whatever the user's preferred time for washing the dishes or preferred the time for uh, charging the electric vehicle is. And it should communicate with the uh, the renewable energy sources in the home uh, to collect data uh, regarding how much energy is available at that time or at a particular time, how much forecasted energy will be available, and uh, it should communicate with the appliances finally to see what the appliance schedules, you know, the current appliance schedules are uh, to collectively decide on how to manage the energy in this home. So that's, that's the idea we're, we're shooting for. Now, what we did is, you know, when we were studying this, we actually looked around for some power profiles for appliances. We couldn't find some, so we did our own. We distributed a bunch of meters to uh, people. Uh, people went down to their homes and they collected the uh, uh, power profiles of the appliances for different devices. So we have a database of uh, how much energy is consumed by, you know, various devices uh, in home. And uh, this is part of the input that is fed into our system. Uh, the horizontal axis in these diagrams is minutes and the vertical axis is watts. So that's, that's one of the things. Now, the second thing that's contributing, we, as we mentioned, the second important input that's coming in to the, to the energy uh, problem that we're having is electric vehicles. And you can see that you know, in the normal charge mode, uh, the, uh, which is six to eight hours, we're looking at you know, a need of three to uh, three kilowatts or one to five kilowatts, as they you know, largely put it. Or in short term, you know, two to six hours, uh, we're looking at 2 to 22 kilowatts of power levels in semi-fast charging and fast charging less than one hour. It's going to be in 
uh, and enough power basically for an entire uh, uh, perhaps house. So this is um, the problem is compounded, and I think we're making it even a little bit more complex. You know, like now, as I said, the time of use pricing is there, the tiered pricing is there, but it is on a very large scale. So when you look at time of use pricing, the time of use pricing is divided into summer and winter. It's not rather, you know, like during the different uh, days, or it doesn't change from one day to the next. It's seasonal rather than daily or weekly. And uh, we're, we're making it a little bit more complex here by basically adding time of use pricing during the day and uh, uh, adding tiered pricing on it so that we can have basically up to 600, up to uh, 600 kilowatts, uh, 600 watts here, we're going to have 10 cents per kilowatt and above it, it will have 13 kilowatt. This is between uh, time zero to uh, seven. And then, you know, between uh, 7 to uh, 2 o'clock, we're looking at basically uh, about 500 kilowatts uh, per, uh, up to 500 watts. We're looking at uh, 14 cents and above it's 16 cents and so on. So now that's basically the, uh, the notion. I think uh, eventually we're going to come to this point where uh, the power will be priced on a, uh, based on the demand and it will be applied to the residential consumers as well. This is available already in some sense, not completely as, it, as we show it like this, but this is available in some sense in some in form of incentives to the business consumers. So what I have here is I have the power need on a regular basis and on a usual day, uh, what we do is we turn on our coffee machine, you know, we have some coffee uh, we have the microwave, you know, for our breakfast and stuff, and we have some television, uh, some air conditioner is running, whatever. I mean, it's not necessarily in this order, but uh, we have uh, the air conditioner runs, you know, like uh, we have uh, the washer and dryer is running, probably not every day in your home, uh, but uh, the, you know, sort of a usual schedule in a regular home. So what I have in this diagram is, the, some of these appliances are not really schedulable. When we look at these appliances, you know, I don't think we're going to schedule our coffee. You know, let me drink coffee after three hours because electricity is expensive. Now, we'll drink it anyways, okay? But certain things such as dishwasher, you know, washers, dryers, we can schedule it. Rather than specifying wash it now, we can specify a window of three hours. And if any time within that three hours, if this job is completed, we are fine. So that's basically what we are trying to show here is some tasks are not schedulable, so they would exist regardless. And other tasks that are schedulable can be scheduled around. And if you consider this, you know, as uh, for half an hour or for an hour of period, 500 watts is now very small when you, can, when you aggregate a whole neighborhood uh, into, into a bundle. So when we look at basically the appliances, if we do not use any uh, tiered pricing or any kind of scheduling, our operating cost for the dishwasher, for the washer, and for the dryer would be, you know, eight cents, forty-four cents, and sixty-three cents. If we go ahead and if we specify a, specify a window where the system can schedule this any time, the dryer or the washer can be scheduled any time, or the dishwasher, then we could benefit when, as you can see here, you know, like when, we scale, when we started here, it's we're in the expensive period, but if we can do the same job right here, okay, if we can run the washer and dryer right here, we're going to be around four cents down per kilowatt, so that will gain, give us some savings. And that's what we are trying to do here. We're trying to basically, uh, manage the, the load around the time of use pricing scenarios that we developed so that the cost will be, will be minimized. This is a, a very complex uh, picture. I am hoping it will be visible, but uh, that basically shows the different components of the system. What you, we have here in this large box is what we call as master controller. This is the unit that predicts the appliance usage profiles that learns from the consumer, that interacts with the consumer, and uh, that is also used for turning on appliances, turning off appliances. You can consider this as, as a remote control for your dishwasher. The only thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't load the dishwasher. 
Uh, the unit that you're seeing here is, is an aggregator. This a unit uh, is a server that runs off the internet and it aggregates the demand submitted by master multiple residential consumers by master controllers. It aggregates the demand and it comes up with a pricing based on the demand, the aggregate demand, and communicates that pricing back to the master controller. The master controller has, a, has an appliance scheduler which based on the, the, the pricing offered and based on the user's requests, it schedules the appliances and communicates the schedules to the home area network, to the appliance, uh, to appliance network by using a home area, uh, an appliance manager and a home area <laughs> network gateway. So what we did is we basically developed appliance controllers we can turn, which can turn on and off appliances. This is a self-learning uh, network. It requires zero configuration from the user. Every node, uh, when they are instantiated, they introduce themselves to the network and what kind of device they are, and they become part of the larger home area network. And uh, within that, they also uh, introduce to the master controller what kind of commands they can accept, what modes they have, and at what modes, what kind of power consumption they have. So all this information is handled by the appliance controllers. And at the same time, they can turn on appliances, turn off appliances. They are simple electrical relays with uh, 802.15.4 interfaces. Home energy gateway is... Uh, communicates with the master controller through a Bluetooth to 802.15.4 gateway and uh, the home energy manager is designed using a cross-platform environment so it runs pretty much on every environment uh, and uh, the picture that you are seeing is running on a, a Nokia N900 or Nokia MIMO as well MIMO, using MIMO operating system uh, on a, a QT program running on a Nokia N900 phone. But it also runs on a, on a PC or on other uh, structures. Now, this is basically the whole you know, picture that, that the system that we are uh, introducing. And as we looked at the master controller, the master controller collects input from the user. The user schedules appliances, schedules the start time, the stop time, or the duration within what period this job should be completed. Uh, that comes from the user. The, you, it collects information from the, uh, from the ANFIS model, which basically estimates when the device in the past, you know, if you're waking up every day for the last N days and you're turning on your coffee machine every day at 8 o'clock, so our system basically predicts that, hey, this you know, person is going to turn on his coffee machine at 8 o'clock, and then the uh, inputs coming from the appliances, appliances tells what kind of power they need, what type of duty cycle they need to run in, and the, the operating duration, the modes of operation, at what mode, how much power is consumed, and eventually the master controller provides uh, input to the appliances, turns them on and off, depending on uh, what the scheduler decides. And this is just another picture, a more clear picture of the same structure. So, uh, the different components of this whole system, I'll show you a nicer picture actually. This whole system is based on a, a tiny OS uh, system, TLOS B. So we expanded TLOS Bs with uh, uh, relay nodes and then we expanded them by using a Bluetooth uh, module and uh, interface them to, this is an N800 uh, uh, device. It's one of those in early internet tablets. When we started to work with it, we started with this, and then we upgraded to a mobile phone. Uh, so the critical, there are two critical components of the system, okay? The hardware is not. The two critical components of the system are one is predicting what the appliance schedules will be tomorrow, okay? What will be whether what would be the load tomorrow that's one of the things that we're trying to estimate and we're looking at basically the usage patterns uh, they're non-linear uh, they are uh, the user decides anytime you know like whenever he wants to turn on his device he can turn on his device any device now with some probability though we can estimate based on the the, uh, exit, the environmental and social factors of course holidays you know vacations 
uh, and other factors, temperature, other environmental factors, we can estimate the, uh, the usage pattern of appliances. And for this, what we did is we used ANTES. Okay, so it's an adaptive fuzzy neural inference system that we used. The inputs are uh, the past usages of the appliances, the users, um, the environmental factors, the days of the week. Uh, I think we went back uh, 15 days, uh, you know, into the history for the days of use. And then we went back, you know, like uh, we had added also the holidays, etc., as input to determine this. And eventually, for the data that we generated, uh, we estimated, uh, you know, the uh, blue lines and red lines represents the patterns for generated data and uh, the predicted results. So the blue lines are the data that we generated. And then based on the generated data, we estimated what the uh, predicted schedules should be and uh, they turned out to be a pretty good estimation. So this is for the microwave oven, uh, television, refrigerator, and washing machine. Of course, this is by no means at the end of this, right? What we do is basically with this estimation, we are going to go to an aggregator and the aggregator is going to bundle this with all the demands, predicted demand from other residential, uh, the other uh, residences and it will eventually decide on a, on a pricing for, uh, to reduce the demand. Uh, the, uh, the, for the appliances, the typical inputs that we used for an air conditioner, let's say we use past operating pattern, day of the week, holiday, working day, time, outside temperature, season, number of occupants. Uh, the, for the television, the, the temperature didn't really make sense, so we used different inputs. And for each appliance, uh, different inputs are used for the uh, input to the ANFIS uh, system for the prediction. Now, this is again another picture that shows basically the uh, actual usage pattern and the predicted usage pattern, and we estimated a pretty close result. I know pretty close is not very scientific, but a pretty close uh, result for the, for the future usage. Now, this, at this point, this is where we are. So we predicted the energy demand, and that energy demand is going to go to the aggregator, where the aggregator will uh, decide on some economy, you know, by some, using some economic principles, use it, decide on a pricing plan. We developed also a solution for that, and it's currently in works for publication. So the outcome of this, eventually the pricing decision made, will be communicated back to the appliance scheduler, and now, what I have here is I have here uh, the different tiered you know, pricing from different, uh, uh, at uh, different times of the day, different, uh, you know, both time of use pricing and tiered pricing uh, overlaid on each other. And uh, we call this as differential pricing. And we need to, now we also received uh, the, we also have the estimated appliance scheduling. So what we want to do is we want to schedule appliances around this. And this is, this, this graph shows the background, the load that we have. These are the, the lightly shaded area shows basically the power load that we are going to have anyways because we cannot schedule these. And uh, the uh, gray area, the dark area shows the power load that we can schedule around. And I'm going to show you some pictures in a, in a few minutes. So this is an example of power availability you know, the ranges and the prices, as I showed earlier, uh, the cost of electricity during this period for the first 500 <laughs> watts, and then the next 250 watts at this price, and then the next, uh, uh, you know, above this at 17 cents per kilowatt at this rate. And if we go to the peak period, we're going to have 2 point, uh, you know, 22.5 cents per, per kilowatt. So it's quite a bit of difference between different times and the uh, different uh, tiers. Now, this is um, a picture that shows before and after uh, our scheduler runs. So what our scheduler does is it basically shifts the loads around, trying to estimate uh, by using dynamic programming, uh, trying to estimate what would be the best uh, place for this. 
the trick, I guess, run, uh, lies in the, in the pricing because uh, what you want to do is you don't want to come up with a pricing scenario that will shift everybody away from the peak period and create other peaks. You want to create a pricing plan so that only a certain portion of the uh, people will move away or will basically attract only a limited or a certain portion of the people, a predictable portion of the people from the peak period, not everybody. So, but the, what I'm that's, that's a different problem that's not addressed here. What we are looking at here is we're looking at basically uh, the first thing is we have uh, in appliances that are not schedulable. All the air conditioner can be schedulable. We can use basically pre-cooling after and stuff. Uh, the dishwasher, washer, and dryer are the ones that we concentrated and we used in our models. Uh, the dishwasher was originally scheduled here, and we shifted it, our scheduler, after our scheduler runs. It shifts it a little bit so that it does not benefit from time of use pricing, but it benefits from tiered pricing because at this point, when you run your dishwasher at this point, it will be running at the same time with the television, and uh, you will hit a different tier, and you will be... Uh, penalized for this. On the other hand, when I look at the, uh, the washer and the, the dryer, they are you know, scheduled at this point and when we shift it, basically what we do is we benefit from time of use pricing and uh, we uh, from here, and we also benefited here from tier pricing because it was running at the same time as the air conditioner was running. So we benefited a lot from both uh, tier pricing and, uh, and uh, time of use pricing. So the costs, based on the models that we generated, the cost of running the appliances did go down, especially for the washer. It did go down from uh, you know, $0.44 to $0.02. Uh, that is right here because we shifted from basically from this tier, from this you know, like zone to the next zone, which was priced uh, uh, considerably different. So this is, this is uh, a system that basically Without the user being aware, it learns from the user's past behavior, and uh, it uh, estimates what the user, what the usage pattern of appliances will be. Communicates the usage pattern of appliances to an aggregator, uh, which aggregates the traffic, and uh, eventually it schedules appliances based on schedules appliances, runs them at exactly the times that are specified by the scheduler to complete the jobs at the time within the constraint that the user placed. And uh, the, uh, this is a pictorial illustration of the aggregator. Basically, our residential users uh, communicate with an aggregation process. We have a time of use price generation process that generates time of use pricing for the, based on the peak demand and based on uh, the availability of the power and the demand that is submitted by the residential consumers. And then this uh, should generate uh, uh, enough incentives for uh, moving a certain portion of the people away from this. Uh, this is you know, still work in progress, but that's what we do. Basically, we get the power consumption from individual users uh, aggregated and then based on this aggregation, generate a pricing plan and communicate that pricing plan back to the individual uh, homes to be utilized by the master controller uh, to schedule appliances. This is a larger uh, illustration of the uh, master controller in relation with the home area network. What we have is basically, oops, that was actually my last slide. And I think, uh, that was it. It just, oh, okay, it didn't kill it. Uh, so, if it comes back. Right. So, what we have is basically we have here, we have nodes that are running H02.15.4. On top of this, we designed our self organizing network, which is pretty scalable. Uh, and uh, it uh, requires zero user configuration. Um, we designed uh, an, a, you know, a power profile similar to Zigbee's power profile to interface with the home area, home area network gateway and uh, communicate with the master controller to receive and uh, to transmit 
commands and to submit uh, statuses. So you can turn on appliances here, and, but you can also turn them on here. If you turn on an appliance here, the appliance reports the status to the master controller so that that uh, user uh, activity is logged. And if you turn on an appliance here, then that is uh, uh, interpreted as a command and the appliance is going to be turned on by submitting a command from the appliance manager. And these are some of the early models that we used. Uh, the N900 is the master controller that basically runs the entire uh, intelligence in our system. Uh, but it's a QT-based software. It runs uh, basically on every platform. Uh, the appliance controller is, uh, is a bunch of hardware that we put on top of a Telos B mode. And uh, uh, the Bluetooth gateway is, uh, this is packaged nicer now and they're all ready to go into appliances. So this is basically a Bluetooth uh, gateway module, uh, again, running uh, our own code on a Telos B platform. And that concludes my talk. I think I'm uh, even a little bit early. Yes, thank you, Dr. Arthur. Thank you. So uh, we have any questions for Dr. I'm like Arthur? five minutes early. Where did those price schedules come from? Where did the price schedules come from that you were showing? Oh, with okay. The so the price oh, schedules are there is uh, uh, right now. Right now, in our solution, the price schedule is determined by the aggregator. Okay. So we basically designed an experimental uh, pricing scenario that we are running, but eventually uh, the pricing will be a two-tier thing. Right. One will be the aggregator is going to receive the demand and uh, will submit the, the demand for, to, the, uh, to the power company. And the power company, just like it does now, it will require the aggregator to reduce the demand uh, by X amount of kilowatts within uh, you know, one hour. That's when the power company, the aggregator, is going to uh, kick in their you know, differential pricing and uh, try to curtail, you know, move away consumers from that point. But they went to the, at the, presently, the pricing is coming from the aggregator. Yes. Um, sorry, I have a couple of questions. So um, I guess at a very high level, um, how big is this uh, um, market that you can actually uh, change, play with the demand, like as a portion of the total uh, energy consumption right. um, in, the, uh, in a particular utility, in a particular area per se? And then, sorry, also, um, for, from a consumer's uh, point of view, unless you have like real, real-time pricing mm -hmm. signals and incentives, and assume that consumers are willing to respond and are capable to respond, um, unless that is like reality, I think consumers, it's easiest thing for consumers to do is just shift their load that they, they can shift to, to the uh, low pricing period, and then do everything else that they don't can't, they can't really like coffee mix Everything else, they can't really change it, do it at whatever time they want. Right. And that's, that's what the, this talk is all about, right? So yeah. what mm -hmm. we are saying is, uh, right now, the consumer doesn't care, OK? I did actually set up a lab in my garage. And I work in my garage. But at the same time, my garage has the washing machine and uh, the dryer. And they conflict with my working schedule. So to, you know, like, uh, when I wanted to move them away, I learned that, well, you know, then it's more expensive you know, to wash it at other times. So I'm working at the same time with that noise. But uh, when you look at it, you know, this is sort of, some people already monitor that. That real-time pricing is not there. With the course schedule, people are monitoring it. Now, if the real-time pricing comes in without a system like this, uh, the, you know, this consumer is not going to be able to run this. So with this, a system like this will basically remove the consumer from the burden of managing their real-time energy uh, needs, but rather the consumer is going to schedule it you know, like within X number of hours. Let's say, I want the dishes to be washed at 5 o'clock. Now, once the dishwasher is loaded, if it is loaded at 1 o'clock, I don't care within that uh, four hours whenever it is, you know, the task is done. It takes an hour, so it can start it at 3 o'clock or it can start it at 2 o'clock. Now, if the consumer doesn't have to care about this, I think this is realizable. Um, also, for the grid operators, like what's the incentive for the grid operators to have aggregator in between? If they can get, gather the information and the data from consumers and have some sort of control of their uh, behavior, such as demand, 
uh, why can't they just do, the, do it themselves? Why I think the grid them? operators are already using the aggregators, right? The grid operators are using the aggregators for large-scale consumers. The aggregators are already going to industrial establishments, determining what their power consumption is, identifying that, you know, if they turn off uh, four of the six elevators they have, they could reduce the power consumption X amount of time. So this is already in place, and there is for both the grid operator and the, the aggregator, there are incentives in this. The grid operator doesn't have to go and manage this at a, you know, like at a low level. Uh, instead, it uses the aggregators to do that, and the aggregators uh, you know, basically makes money off this system. So it's already there. The system is already there. The incentives for both grid operators and the aggregators are, are there. The only exception is the aggregators now are only aggregating large-scale consumers. You know, they are basically a mid or large uh, energy consumers. They are not accepting residential consumers. So we are hoping that this will change. Yes, sir. So with, uh, with the exception of individual appliance uh, uh, power consumption, which you can get from nameplates or the templates from you download from the, 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 the web or in mm -hmm. load monitors, there seems to be little reference to kind of whole building electrical use. So my question is, if it ever comes to pass, and there's been a lot of difficulty in getting this to move forward, that smart meters will emanate real-time pricing and real-time consumption information into the home, mm -hmm. is there a place for that information to feed into this architecture, or is, it, is the business case for this kind of aggregated scheduling process pretty much independent of whether smart meter data ever comes into the home or not? No, I think I think it's very critical. Now, uh, right now, you know, because we, uh, right now, what our system does is our system basically looks at the estimated, you know, the appliance schedules to predict the future usage. But I think this is a little bit uh, fine granular. I think we can basically go step one one step above, and use the for the aggregator. The aggregator doesn't really care about the dishwasher or the television or any of this. It only cares about at any particular time how much energy is consumed in that house, and that's what we are what we are providing it to him, right? So that information is already available at the smart meter. So I think you are very right that you know that information which is available at the smart meter should replace a portion of the information that we are gathering from the home. But regardless. When the data, when the pricing information comes to the home, we'll still use the appliance, you know, like that power information that we have from the appliance to schedule it. So I think uh, you're very right. It will replace some of the information that we are trying to collect from the home and supply to the aggregator or the power company, but it will not replace, you know, the scheduling end of it. Yes, sir. So you said that some a system like this could save you two cents every time you use your washing machine. Uh, it's if you use it like once a week, say after ten years, that saves you ten bucks. Uh, this is. I think uh, we should we should you know like it's hypothetical prices, but I think uh, we should look at basically uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, you know larger consumers. You know, like tomorrow you bought a hybrid electric vehicle, you come home and you plugged it in. So now we're talking about real energy consumption, okay? You plugged it in at 8 o'clock or at 10 o'clock, okay? So that will make a difference. So what I, you know, what we are saying is, well, you just come home and plug it in, okay? Now you don't have to worry about how much the energy is at that point and uh, how much it will be after two hours. You'll plug it in and you will, you know, like you told your uh, car basically that, hey, I want you to be charged at 8 o'clock, okay? And then you can go to bed, and whatever the time that we choose, we can, you know, we can start that charging process. Now, that will make a big difference. And then, you know, like when you think about the washing machine, don't underestimate it. You know, in my house, washing machine runs all the time. <laughs> okay? Hi, there's uh, two parts of the system that I didn't quite understand. Um, the first is, if you have like a washing machine or a dryer, how it is that the, the moat that you're adding actually actuates the appliance to... Oh, it's a relay. Hold on. Okay, yes. but if I just turn on my, a relay, power relay to my washer, it doesn't run the washing cycle. So that's the first part. But the second part was about security and joining and how networks are formed and uh, wh where you see who you imagine is going to be configuring 
these devices to join the network in such a way that, you know, sort of there's some level of security and, right. and what your vision for that is? Right. So, um, the, in an independent study, what we did is, in an independent, the, the modes that we're using are using 802.15.4 nodes. And 802.15.4 nodes, by default, you know, we're using CC2420s. They already uh, ha are configured, basically, for uh, managing two keys, uh, two desk keys, so, uh, two AES keys. So what we did is, we, in an independent study, we extended this a little bit. So now our system can uh, have 200, can support, basically, 256 keys, OK? So you can have 256 key pairs. Uh, under software control, we basically, um, you know, move the keys in and out of the key registers to control that. Now, you will still need to bring in, you know, when you bring in the home, I think you will need a button where you press the button, you press the other button, and you let these two devices to come up with a key and to exchange this. That, you know, those kind of practicalities are there. You're right. And uh, this is, you know, this is serious concern. But... In independent studies, we're looking at basically the infrastructure to support that. That's a real problem. Um, what was the other question? Sorry? Oh, the relays. I think, uh, I, right. So, so the, uh, the, um, w the relays that we're using now are basically turning on and off, simple, you know, turn the device on, turn the device off, rather than you know, uh, supplying a bunch of control information to the device. But there are already devices that are coming in. A GE has a bunch of devices that are coming in with, you know, con control interfaces where you can supply uh, commands to turn on a particular mode. I think uh, that level of integration, we are not addressing it. And as I said, you know, the strength of the uh, solution now or the strength of this talk is not really concentrated on device interface, but it's rather the idea of predicting the usage pattern and uh, uh, predicting the usage pattern and coming up with uh, with a pricing to optimize the power usage. But uh, there are appliances that are you know already providing some command and control interface where we can interface that. Hopefully, G is going to also uh, accept you know give us a an interface that we can plug in rather than doing everything themselves. That's not going to happen, you said, <laughs> right? Okay, you're laughing. So I, I, I had another uh, a quick question about the, the yes. aggregator role. So uh, one, of the, one of the justifications for getting uh, clear access from the utilities through the meter into the home uh, was for scheduling critical uh, uh, activities like uh, electrical vehicle charging. Uh, and it, was, it, it wasn't just for overall uh, uh, price uh, uh, load, load shaping, but there were critical safety issues if you have too many people doing 220 volt charging in a particular neighborhood, you start blowing up pull top transformers, at, you know, things like that. So what, what seems to be the case here is that the role of the aggregator becomes much more like an extension or, or a kind of specialized extension of the utility operations environment. And so there's a role for them that's sensitive to what, what your address is, what circuit you're on, and things like that. So, have, have you folks had a chance to look at the added level of complexity between the aggregator and utility interface? And are they, is there a willingness to move forward you know, with that we, level of? We, we did not. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, you know, that's one of the open, open issues that uh, the network that we are looking at or the work that we have does not actually look at what the existing infrastructure is. You know, if a particular consumer uh, pool is requesting a certain amount of demand, whether this demand can be supplied or not. So we're only looking at now the pricing that, you know, that the utility company tells us. If the utility company tells us that, hey, reduce the power usage within, you know, the next two hours, you know, by 50 kilowatts. So that's the only thing that we're basically basing our, uh, our uh, system. Now, I think that's probably a good step forward to, you know, to also look at the infrastructure needs and uh, to see if the demand that is requested by the consumer is going to supply that. Now, I'm also assuming that, you know, like at the present, we can uh, compensate it by r pricing rightly so that when the usage, when the demand at a particular, you know, uh, period 
uh, comes out to be high, we can punish this severely uh, and offer incentives to move the load to other periods, assuming that the customers also had some schedulable loads. Before we go on to the next questions, I just want to make a statement about this project. This project was funded uh, by the California Energy Commission. It was a project that I managed. Um, it was not intended to be a, a commercial product. Uh, it was a proof of concept demonstration. Uh, there's two unique factors to this project uh, that I was quite interested in and the reason why the project was funded. One is the, is the um, uh, home energy controller, which, you know, there's quite a bit of uh, research in, in that area, but the uniqueness of it was the, was the prediction of the scheduling. And the other unique part of the, of the project was the uh, uh, aggregator server, which is, uh, takes information from uh, multiple homes within a, a neighborhood and provides uh, a mechanism for the utilities to, depending on how much um, demand that can be reduced from, from the homes reporting back to this aggregator to come up with a pricing. So this was something that uh, I think San Diego Gas and Electric was also familiar, uh, uh, yes. was interested in, and they were sort of a collaborate on this project. So uh, just want to make, <laughs> make that statement. So we'll Thank go you. on to the next Thank question. Thank you, Gamet. Yes, and uh, I have one question regarding the demand response uh, validation. And uh, as far as I can see, you have to get some base schedule to to validate or calculate the demand response. And I would like to ask how you can get the base schedules uh, from from the individual customers. Uh, from the customers? Yeah. Uh, that's what we do, right? So basically, what we are doing is the master controller is the unit that uh, looks at the customer's uh, uh, use appliance usage in the past. That's one piece of information. And the second piece of information is through the supplied user interface, the customer chooses actually the actions that he's going to do, the appliance runtimes that he's going to perform in the future. And that information, we bundle that information and we communicate that information to the uh, aggregator. And that information, you know, communicated by multiple consumers is aggregated, overlaid at, uh, uh, summed at the aggregator to determine what the base uh, demand is going to be. Have any more? Oh, one more. So um, the when, so you're trying to schedule appliances, but appliances interact with people. So for instance, when you have to switch from the washing machine to the dryer, now if you let the system schedule that for you, now you have to. For instance, you originally wanted to do your laundry at eight o'clock, so you can go to bed at ten. Now uh, the systems decided to schedule the washer to start at 10, now you have to go change the laundry into the dryer at 11 and ideally want to fold your laundry at midnight, that now your entire schedule is put off. It seems like there's very few appliances that you'd be able to reschedule since so many of them interact. So like the electric car you said is a good example because you don't interact with that while it's charging. Um, but even like air conditioning, unless you have some kind of like a heat storage system, you can't really reschedule that because people want it to work when they want it to work. Right, I think uh, you're, you're very right. That's why the, we're letting the customer to decide what he wants to do or what he can afford to do, right? So if you come home at, uh, let's say, at 5 o'clock, and if you schedule your washing machine and dryer to be, you know, both of them back-to-back, -back, and as you can see in my examples, they're also back-to-back, -back, and I, you know, hope that they would be. Now, then, you know, within that window, you know, like rather than starting at 9 o'clock, you will constrain it to start between 5 o'clock and 8 o'clock so that the job will be done at 9 o'clock and you can go to bed at 9 o'clock. But during that period, you are, you know, like, uh, you're going to attend the washing machine to move the clothes from the washer to put it to the dryer, you are right. So that basically interruptions, that level of interaction is going to be uh, commanded by the user because the user can constrain it. Dr. Kumar. But eventually, you know, it's a lot of saving when you put all the homes together. So we should not look at each home as a, you know, as a, a individual unit. 
you know, so basically the idea was the customers will have some, you know, some, what should I say, some environmental consciousness. You know, they don't want to use whenever they want to use. Uh, so if you are willing to participate in the process and, you know, like uh, in our area, HDG gives a lot of incentive for new technology. You want to buy a, you know, Energy Star appliance and they give incentive. So if there is an incentive for this kind of system and the system is cheap, master controller is the only cost actually, uh, if the wireless interface is already there, then together we can help the grid a lot. Right? So we should not think that, okay, you know, each appliance is saving only two cents or, you know, it's a, you know, one hour only shift. But eventually, you know, total, it can be tremendous because home, uh, because residential customers still, you know, form a large bulk of the total load on the grid. So the aggregator <clears throat> sends time of use pricing to the residences. Are those prices ever charged to the residences, or are those just signals? Those are the those are the prices that the user is going to pay if he uses the appliance at that particular time. So they just pass it on from the utility. They just pass it on. Well, the uh, the the aggregator basically, uh, you know, in in our view, the aggregator is an entity. It's like a reseller. If you know, and they decide ultimately what the energy price is going to be during that time. So it's an extension of the utility company. It's a bypass of the utility company. But the aggregator, in our case, decides what the price of the energy is going to be at that at that point. Okay. So the now it could be. Pay. I mean, the, in the actual you know process, the utility some utility companies may just come and say, hey, you know, okay, I'm not going to let you decide on the pricing of the energy, you just tell me what the demand is, I'm going to decide on the pricing myself, and you just communicate to the users. Do you think regulators will allow an aggregator to set electricity prices? Uh, the regulators already allow, I don't know, but the regulators already allow aggregators to come up with incentives uh, to the consumers and to basically curtail their load. Right? They basically, you know, like, uh, they can turn off your two elevators to reduce the power consumption in the next two hours and for this they give you uh, a break in your pricing in the next month or whenever you know the electricity is in abundance so they already do that but I can't speak for the regulators you know could be a brave new world <laughs> okay I think that's it thank you very much thank you thank you very much